Um, today, I, I'll be talking about uh, movements of significance um, or significant movements. And I want to, I think Joanna already ha had a certain summary that I like better now, but indeed I want to switch around and say that uh, expressive or communicative movements that I study um, are expressive because they are movements uh, and because they are uh, movements that um, emerge from a body with uh, um, with masses, with certain stabilities. And um, I wonder whether we can start thinking about meaning arising from bodily dynamics. Um, and um, maybe quickly about me, uh, about the trajectory that I've been in. I started a, a bachelor in psychology, just classic cognitivism and really good basis, right? And I guess all the things that we, we get, we, uh, we, we either start to hate or it's always an anchor, like uh, the, the mental representations, they are key to uh, humans uh, being in the world. Uh, they are key to our intelligence. They are key to our, to our uniqueness. Um, these are things that you generally fall on this cognitivist kind of uh, uh, idea or that representations uh, proliferate, that we proliferate as humans because we represent. Um, that uh, in linguistics you get similar kind of ideas about uh, languages of thought that allow you to schematize about the world in ways uh, that are very much abstracted away from it, right? And then um, we, uh, after my bachelor, I, I uh, one second, I have to close this, yeah. Um, in my batch, then I did a research master in psychology, and that was more on the, at the time it was embodiments, embodiments, and sensory motor simulations, and sensory motor grounding. It was also the time of the replication crisis, but this is something that I was taught up with, uh, or was or was brought up with, with uh, with this, uh, which I was also really enthused about, uh, the symbol grounding problem, and I'm still enthused about it in, in principle, but I, I'm also... I also became more skeptical about this, but um, and this is precisely because I feel like the body is still missing. Then I did a theoretical psychology master, really on the radical embodied cognitive science uh, part. Um, so that went into uh, Heideggerian uh, psychology from uh, Michael Wheeler and uh, inactivism, De Ager, Di Paolo. And it was really more philosophy of mind. And uh, we wrote a paper as well that was published, a really bad paper in theoretical psychology, if I read it now. But at least I always had some affinities with radical and body of science. But then I applied for a PhD that was, again, more towards the sensory model grounding. So my, my supervisors were more known for, for their work in, uh, in, in that kind of uh, literature. So, um, but now, uh, then, then I moved to uh, University of Connecticut, which was an ecological psychology department. And, uh, uh, um, so the center of the ecological study of perception and action, so Gibsonian psychology. And I think from there on out, I feel like, uh, I, I don't really want to associate with anything, <laughs> but I do feel like I'm moving more towards indeed a realizing uh, or an applied radical and body cognition. I hope I hope that that is something that I can contribute to. So um, there are a couple of lines of research that I uh, that I, I think uh, characterize what I've done right uh, so far, but I will only focus on gesture focal biomechanics. I also like open science practices, signal processing uh, kind of stuff, because there's a lot of happening now in multimodal signal processing worlds or computer vision. So it's pretty exciting. So I try to keep up to date with that. And also, uh, and other things are using kinematics to understand more representational, iconic kind of gestures and other, other aspects is rhythm. But I'll, I'll focus on gesture vocal biomechanics because it also fits, I think, uh, with an applied radical in body cognition, I would say. So let's just focus on the phenomenon, um, uh, or just have something ready to ready to hand if we want to talk about the things that I study, right? Communicative uh, gestural movements.
well, this is a certain genre that I really like, but uh, it's of course a certain genre will 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 solicit certain uh, gestures gestures. But one thing that you already saw is that Merkel, uh, as a gesture researcher, she could look at this phenomenon in different ways, right? Uh, I think Merkel is something saying something like pressure on the borders. Is she making inside and outside uh, kind of iconic, uh, or they would say maybe metaphoric gesture, right? And that's that maybe that the representational aspect that we're often enamored with. So how, how, where do we come from? Uh, uh, do they reflect something like our language of, or, of thought or um, uh, how, what kind of representational formats are needed to en engage in these kind of representational tools? But there's also another way of looking at these uh, gestures, right? So there is, she's not only saying the border, she's also in our prosodic uh, modulations, the borders are getting a certain emphasis, right? She's rhythmically actually uh, highlighting uh, the, um, um, her speech with her hands as well. And it's the same here with the more extreme, like uh, uh, literally you have somebody beating energy into the system as it were and saying, I, I find this important, right? Uh, and I think this is a, um, a bodily kind of uh, meaning making, um, that might be meaningful because it operates at the boundaries of a certain action repertoire or action routines that you generally do, right? So if I tr if I scream loudly, I'm actually at the boundaries boundaries of what I can do, and that's already inherently meaningful, I think. And that's that's why I think I'll come back to this as well in, in classic motor control laws, where I think well maybe gesture might be a little bit different. They are designed to be different. Um, and I'll come back to those, those things. So if we look, focus more on the bodily and, and keep aside the, the representational aspects for now, um, if then we also move away a little bit from the dictionary idea of gestures, where a gesture is a body movement to express an idea or a meaning. Gesture is like a prime where, where the real thing is in the head, right? Often you could see in some writings or readings, or when in my readings of some writings, I read that gesture is more like a representation of a mental representation uh, and nothing more. And, or it is seen as a window into the mind, as if the mind is inside and a gesture is its mere window, right? So um, I like uh, Marla Ponty's chapter six a lot, um, where, it's not specifically about hand gesture, but also speech gestures, but it applies equally to gesture. So gesture or speech in the speaker does not translate ready-made thought, but accomplish, uh, accomplishes it. The gesture does not make me think of anger, it is anger. Um, and I think I just wanna keep that as a reminder and maybe it comes back, or at least that's something that kind of silently um, sometimes informs my research, I would say. So, the thing that I want to talk about is this gesture focal biomechanics, right? What is it? Um, I think this uh, also comes, this is uh, thanks to uh, uh, Rubicon Grant at the time and thanks to my work at, at CESPA, where, where I also started to learn to think differently about these things. Uh, but because remember, I was more from this classic, uh, or at least sensor or motor cognition kind of uh, classic, still cognitivist kind of uh, thinking. and. Uh, at the time there, I really started to think differently about gestures in that they are bodily. And what does it mean that they are bodily? For, for one thing is that they have a mass. They, 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 they uh, move in ways with a certain perturbation, right? Especially the beat line kind. So in gesture studies, we do already have ways of thinking about uh, gesture and speech coupling uh, from uh, perspectives that align more with, with the dynamical systems kind of work. So I'll, I'll quickly go over it. Kelso, for example, show that if you try to tap and uh, say pa, pa, pa at the same time, you already get this in-phase relationship similar as uh, finger wagging, but you also find that if you have to inhale that the, the, the finger automatically slows down or stops a little bit uh, without really a lot of conscious thought, there's already a coordination between these different production systems. We also know that if you, for example, you do the stepping task and you, also, and you, you try to focalize at the same moment, if you emphasize in your uh, gesture or in your tap a little bit more, then uh, also unconsciously, you also tend to emphasize a little bit more in your focalization. Um, 
So, and it's also the other way around. So if I say pa, 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 then generally on the emphasis on pa, I also will move my hands slightly differently. These things naturally couple, right? they, they form nat natural coalitions um, and so forth and so forth. There are more like the, the, the bifurcation studies looking at what, when things break down. So if you speed up, things start to break down. Maybe you notice le literature from the coordinative structures and it's also you find between gesture and speech. Um, and, and uh, in general, we know from gesture studies that gesture, uh, the kind of moments of emphasis are often aligned or synchronized with moments of uh, prosodic, prosodically relevant moments, which can be a, a, a pitch accent, um, which can be a lexical stress. Um, so they're often attracted to these moments of uh, Acoustic markers of prosody, such as increases in the, uh, fundamental frequencies, increases in amplitude. So th these things we know. And if you like uh, more recent, I think there is more people working on this kind of dynamical, more holistic way of thinking. I also want to promote some others' work, such as Camilla Alviar's uh, work, recent paper in language sciences, and James Tugilo uh, uh, and Holler's paper um, in uh, perspectives on psych psychological science. I think they are all synthesizing this kind of way of thinking uh, um, that I really like. Um, but I, I think still the, the direction that I'm thinking is a little bit different in the sense that we do, we, we're not, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the physicality of it. So if we look at uh, uh, Angela Merkel doing this with her, both her hands, we, we shouldn't forget that, that it's really, um, like a bipedalism is really an awkward kind of uh, thing because you're you're really unstable. You need to have a lot of mus muscle chains uh, um, flexibly organizing into a gesture. It's a whole body affair. Even if you would stand and I would do like this <laughs> and I would feel my back, you will feel these muscles. For example, the erector spinae will attract at moments you have a deceleration of your hands, it's anticipatory postural adjustments. And it's something that, um, uh, Merkel will uh, will have as well, otherwise she, she would have fall, fallen over. So the point being is that there's also a certain Newtonian mechanics to it, namely that if I move my arms at a certain acceleration or deceleration, it will, de uh, it will affect uh, a whole body muscle chain. And depending on what kind of movements I make, I, I make use of different muscle chains, right? So if we just look at the, a, a brief note on, anatomy is that if we just look at the clavicle and the shoulder girdle and assuming that we do our gestures with our hands, it's already a, a kind of clear that um, there's something go uh, there, there's also something that needs to be going on, namely that local things reverberate more globally if only if we look at the anatomy. For example, the clavicle is ill posed, it's horizontally like this. It's also the, the bone that breaks most often. Um, uh, and it, that's the only thing that keeps the shoulder girdle upright, right? Uh, for at, at least for the compressive elements. The rest, the, the whole shoulder girdle could actually slide off the whole uh, torso, uh, were it not for this small clavicle, but the rest is all suspended. And why is it suspended? Because the, there are not only compressive forces like the clavicle, um, um, but also there are uh, tensile elements. The tensile elements being the fascia, the connective tissues, but also the muscles that, for example, wrap around the chest and insert into the scapula. The scapula can be seen like a like the center of a wheel, and um, the scapula has all kinds of insertions around uh, around its uh, circular axis, and it's actually it keeps the shoulder girdle in a in a constant pre-stress. And what this means is that if I move my arm here, it's a lot of the forces that need to be distributed are luckily not distributed fully over the clavicle because then you would break it often because it's, for example, on vertical loadings, it's, it's, not, it's not really well designed to uh, carry your groceries. No, the tensile elements take over. It's like a, a web, a web-like system, which means that if I move my arms, you can imagine that the serratus anterior posterior will also sometimes stabilize your actions. And that's, that's actually attached to the rib cage, right? And the rib cage, is important. Any movement to the ribcage can affect subglottal pressure, so internal pressures in the lungs, which also affect your focalization, right? 
uh, vocalization or human speech is very much dependent on the respiratory system. It's 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 its base system, um, and uh, um, so these muscles are generally not considered to be respiratory muscles. Uh, some of them are, like the, um, um, and I'll talk about that later. But the point being is, if I move my arms, I will activate respiratory muscles or muscles that are in potential respiratory because they affect movements of the rib cage. So the general idea is that by tensegrity, the idea that uh, something that happens locally can reverberate globally, right? That's one of the take home message, messages, I think. There's another aspect about the anticipatory postural adjustments. Even if I move my hands or my arms in a certain uh, beat like way, this means that there are other postural muscles involved and other postural muscles which are generally considered primary or at least accessory respiratory muscles. Uh, so we know from biomechanics research, if people are rapidly moving their upper, ar upper arms or the upper limbs, then uh, for example, the transversus abdominis um, will uh, activate continuously to keep you upright. And these are also muscles that will, that are classically associated with that respiration. Uh, and there are other examples uh, uh, Paul Hodges is doing a lot of work, has done a lot of work uh, on this in biomechanics that I, I really like. Even the diaphragm is a postural muscle. So even if I move my arms really rapidly, even the diaphragm, which is the inspiratory, inspiratory muscle, has been found to activate to keep uh, a certain system stable, right? So there are a lot of muscles co-stabilizing each other during postural perturbations due to gesture, right? Okay, so... That all kind of influenced uh, us to just look at gesture in a very simple way. Let's have people uh, inhale and then vocalize like this, uh, like this for, for continuously and do some movements. And one of the movements was like a wrist motion. One was like a, uh, or two hands. And um, we've just been looking at uh, acoustics and kinematics um, in steady state vocalizations, but then also increasingly more complex and ecological um, fluent speech. So the, the first study that we found, well, that we did was um, this simple uh, movement. So flexion, extension like this, uh, and people were vocalizing and then we would have, um, so the vertical displacement of the movement in black here, and we have the fundamental frequency. So the pitch perceived as pitch in your vocalization, and we have the amplitude envelope. So the, something that traces out the amplitude of the sound. And uh, we were actually quite surprised at the time uh, that just moving the arms affected the voice in this way. For example, in a warm, one arm movement, you see every time the movement has to decelerate, there was a sudden beat like quality, right? Which we know from gesture. So we said, please uh, decelerate the hand quickly. And it just, just like this. And every time it reached the deceleration phase, you get a peak in the fundamental frequency and peak in the amplitude envelope. And you can try this at home, right? Try to vocalize and then maybe depending on your body more or uh, a little bit more rapidly, it's really difficult to not uh, affect your voice in this way. So you get these peaks in amplitude and this is a dynamic visualization. Maybe you see uh, an overimposed oscillation and that oscillation actually was the the movement of the arms in this case. Um, and for, we find in general that people who are sitting versus standing uh, uh, have a li little bit less of this, these effects. They're still there, but they're less pronounced. And this is uh, already a kind of a cue that the posture related muscles, which are much more extremely uh, activated during a standing position versus a sitting position. We know that from biomechanics research that uh, somehow these posture related muscles uh, are important. Um, and in general, the, the more mass you uh, accelerate, for example, with two hands, the effects are much bigger. Uh, so uh, if I just use my wrist, you can still find it in the acoustics um, for most of the studies that we've done. Um, but if you increase the mass, for example, moving the whole arm or moving two arms, you see that the uh, voice is more affected. Which is also makes sense, right? If I'm if I'm angry and I want to show you something, I might be more likely to use two hands than one hand, right? Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm already 20, 20 minutes in, so I, I have to think a little bit about what I'll what I'll show. But another thing that we did is um, we did the next um, the same the same thing. We had uh, vocalizers do these kind of movements while vocalizing, and then we recorded those uh, vocalizations. We replicated the general thing that that you generally get peaks when there is a deceleration of the movement. 
Um, then we also model those uh, movements by saying, well, we have one motion cycle, let's model the acoustics around that cycle, and you generally get these peaks, right? And for each focalizer, it's slightly different, but in general, you get this shape. Um, but we could ask, well, can people intuitively, if they listen to the sound, can they synchronize with this focalizer? A listener, can you synchronize with this focalizer? So we had different conditions where uh, the vocalizers were moving less fast with a slower rhythm or with a faster rhythm like this, more like a, um, and um, we had people moving with a wrist motion or an arm motion. Um, and they were, the vocalizers were actually looking at a screen that shows that they're moving too wet, fast or too slow, so they didn't get any rhythmic input or anything. It's just a bar that shows you're moving too fast or too slow. Um, and what we find is that vocalizers, maybe it's trivial that they can at least can hear the beat, maybe, or they hear these peaks, right? So you can imagine that they are quite well, and at least if they have to move with the vocalizer, and their task was, the, the task was um, for the listener uh, that this person was moving in rhythm, rhythmic arm motions, uh, like this or like this, the, 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 that was at least explained. But it was their job to try to move at the same in the same way as the uh, vocalizer, and in the same speed and uh, and facing. Um, like I said, it could be trivial that at least they can hear a beat or something happening periodically. Because if let's accept that that this affects the voice. But what was less trivial is that they could actually determine that the movement was downwards uh, by listening to the sound. So there was not only frequency tempo synchronization such that, for example, for slower, or this, this is for faster tempos, the listeners in black were also moving slower and they're moving a little bit, uh, or faster, a little bit slower here too as well. So they generally know the rhythm of the sound, but they also had phase synchronization such that they knew that the phasing, they had an in-phase coordination overall uh, with, the, uh, with the vocalizer. So the idea is that, um, people do not perce perceive these as abstract sounds. They perceive really bodies at a distance. Uh, um, they are um, they are somehow intuit that these peaks in the uh, acoustics or whatever more richer information there is, right, that they correspond to a certain downbeat of a movement. Uh, and we also modeled, for example, the vocalization acoustics. Uh, like I uh, mentioned, and we can express that and how well we can model it, how reliable the information in the acoustics is. And then we can predict the re reliability of our modeling to how well listeners could, could, could couple to the sounds. And indeed, if there is more acoustics that is more stably patterning according to the movement, then listeners were also better in training to this, these kind of sounds, which makes sense. But at least we show that there is acoustic information in there and specifically the fundamental frequency in this case. Um, yeah, so we did some more measurements. Um, uh, we we ex complexified it a little bit. We looked, for example, at uh, chest, um, chest movements through a respiration belt, and it measures the pressure around uh, the chest. And um, um, this uh, allowed us to have a more direct uh, way of saying, well, is it the case if you move your arm, that it also affects the ribcage a little bit? And um, we, ha we have people moving at different rhythms together with their vocalizations, because you can imagine if I'm not vocalizing, but I'm, I'm producing an impulse, then of course it doesn't affect my voice and it's indeed what we find. But if you're vocalizing and you're moving at the same time and you, you're producing an impulse, yeah, then it affects the voice. Uh, and we had these respiration time series um, the amplitude, uh, and again, a similar kind of uh, way that we are working generally. If we model the, the vocalizations, these were monosyllable utterances like pa, which people often use, then we find that arm in phase generally has a higher amplitude, but it also has a more ribcage movement during the vocalization. Um, so, and of course, that's something that we also could show that the more ribcage movement you have, the higher the peak in the amplitude of your sound. So the 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 um, that kind of research becomes a little bit more. We can be a little more directly say that movements affect ribcage, which affect subglottal pressures, which affect vocalization. Um, we also looked at continuous speech, and uh, whilst it's much more varied, right? What what we did is. Well, we have movements and people were continuously speaking during those movements. And we tried to model 
for each movement cycle how the amplitude envelope looks like. And what we generally uh, find that in, in a passive condition, um, um, if we model that for each movement cycle, we see that an R movement actually has an increase in amplitude envelope at the moment of the peak deceleration, quickly, uh, quite before, so uh, 50 to 70 milliseconds. Interestingly enough, the biomechanics research shows that postural adjustments generally happen about uh, 100 to uh, 50 milliseconds before you reach an impulse. So it's uh, anticipatory uh, and can also be reactionary in nature, but that's our, uh, in any case, the risk is a little bit lower. You have less effect because there is less movement. Um, and we were also able to confirm that it's the degree of deceleration uh, of your arm that relates to the peak in that amplitude. So this makes sense because force is expressed as a mass and acceleration, right? Or deceleration, that's just the negative. Uh, um, so we, 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 are, we show, or at least we, we su suggest that we need a way to explain that acceleration scales somehow to these acoustics. Um, um, and we think that's, that's because of biomechanics and forces. Um, so just to summarize this, I call it gesture speed physics 1.0 because I think we now are moving towards a different kind of uh, uh, work. But um, this, this basis work is that pulse like flexion extension, these kind of movements uh, associated with peaks in the amplitude of the voice, sometimes also F0, depends a little bit uh, uh, on how simple the vocalizations are. Um, so F0, the pitch of the sound, but primarily uh, the intensity or the amplitude of the sound, which makes sense because F0, the pitch is very much also dependent on coordination with the vocal folds. So there is another kind of uh, controller there that is not only dependent on subglobal pressures. Um, in general, higher mass movements or uh, segments with a higher mass or either two hands or, or the two uh, arms versus a wrist uh, or higher acceleration scales with the peaks in amplitudes. Um, which makes us more confident that it's a, a matter of force. Um, movement relates to chest kinematics, right? Posture matter, matters, such that for in standing, the gesture focal coupling seems to be a little bit more extreme or a, a little bit more pronounced. Um, but also impulse matters, right? So Helene Serre uh, has done a really cool research with uh, leg cycling, for example, and often the acceleration there is kind of constant. And there they indeed don't really find uh, these acoustic uh, interactions. Um, and it's really, they really show the boundary case that it's not that you're easily affected. You do have to put some energy in the system to, to change your voice like this. And in continuous uh, 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 cycling with not a lot of resistance, you don't, you generally don't find it. Um, so only movement, movements of the beat-like kinds seem to affect this. And we, we need to make, we, and this is kind of interesting because if you think about um, general motor control laws like minimizing jerk, that's generally mo uh, movements or object-directed movements uh, are, uh, are controlled in such a way to minimize the, the changes in acceleration, right? Jerk. Um, but it seems that with gestures, we're, we're actually trying to uh, break these control laws. We're, we're trying to somehow bring em emphasis in our movements, right? And these kind of emphasis we don't want to have when, when picking up an apple, right? Uh, we don't want to do that. But for these kind of communicative actions, we are at the boundaries uh, of our control, our motor control routines. Um, so there is a reason maybe why beat gestures, they call it in gesture studies often this way, beat gestures, why they are beat-like. Um, and they, they might be informative because they operate at the boundaries of these motor control laws. Um, and also another thing that I would like to emphasize, we don't need gesture to speak. I, I really don't think there is such a function for gesture. Um, we can speak perfectly well without gesture our vocalization, acoustics might be completely the same. Um, but if we gesture, we need to deal with the biomechanics of it. And we need to deal with it in a way that either to, to counteract it or to align it in ways that it becomes naturally informative. So I believe that bio biomechanics can be aligned uh, and they can be, they can even be, it's, it's, you can see it as a, what is it? It's not a, it's not a bug, but it can be a feature. Uh, to align your biomechanics in ways uh, um, in communication. 
Um, so, but for example, Mariko Hoetjes in, in 2014 already showed if you just look at the acoustics of people who are gesturing versus not gesturing, and you summarize over them by just like averaging over the acoustics, then you don't see a lot of differences with people who, who gesture or are not allowed to gesture. And I believe there are sensorimotor solutions to reach the same effect, but the process must be different if we're gesturing. Um, so, um, and I, I'm kind of, um, so maybe another way of looking at this is that um, there's this new kind of revolution in uh, machine learning research that shows that you can model acoustics um, uh, or the gestural information is actually present in the acoustics to some extent. So this is work from uh, uh, Gina Sar that I was kind of impressed with. I show you a deep neural network has been trained on um, talk show hosts to take in acoustics and relate it to kinematics. And at a certain moment, this system is able to, from acoustics alone, synthesize gestures that are quite close to the ground truth of the actual movements. So, oh, sorry. So these gestures are machine gestures, but they are at least real in the in the in this oscillatory kind of way. Uh, they look really believably believable, and it says something that you can reconstruct based on this acoustics if you know the associations well. Uh, there is a lot of information in acoustics about gestural uh, gesture information. Um, so yes, if we average out of the acoustics, then yes, then it's true that there is not, not a lot of differences, but there is something in the dynamics of the acoustics that might be informative about gestural movement. Um, okay, I think you don't have audio, no? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah sorry. Well, uh, there was some audio. <laughs> um, um, so maybe, I, I, I think I still have eight minutes. So, um, we I'm now we're now moving it with uh, uh, with all, with a range of researchers and collaborators moving this work a little bit further. Um, one thing is doing proper biomechanics work. A lot of the, the gesture speech 1.0 work was more about kinematics and acoustics, but you also want to have something about direct measurements of uh, muscle activity, for example. We also want to have a better understanding of how this compares to uh, the the um, cross-species literature, we, then we know uh, actually there is a lot of uh, connections between how animals use their bodies in this biomechanical way and, and modulate their vocalizations. And um, some of this work um, we're doing actually with, um, um, also we're, we're doing some direct work with uh, the singing, uh, singing hylobot uh, primates, so the siamang. Uh, and they also move a lot and vocalize at the same time. And there must be some biomechanics involved that we actually don't know a lot about. Um, um, and also in more uh, other aesthetic uh, kind of performances, such as uh, Carnatic, uh, South Indian uh, vocal music, there is also a lot of gesturing and music. So uh, of course, gesturing and this biomechanical, maybe uh, coalition between arm movements and vocalization uh, also pop up in other ways of uh, expressing ourselves, right? Um, so maybe I'll just focus on the, the recent, I can't, I, I don't have time to focus on all these things. So I'm just gonna focus on some more of the, the biomechanics work that we've done right now. So uh, we're now looking at much more varied movements because it could be, for example, that some movements activate different muscle chains, which chains, which will have different effects on the voice, right? It might be much more dynamic than our, we only have looked at these kind of flexion extension movements, but what if we do an internal rotation and external rotations? This will be a totally different muscle. So uh, we, have a, um, we have a study ongoing and a, and, a, and a preliminary study done with some results already, where we measure the muscle activity of the pectoralis major, which is an internal rotator. Um, the infraspinatus is on the back, is an external rotator, so they're agonist, antagonist. Um, and we have postural muscles, uh, the rectus abdominis, so the, the abs, and they have an expiratory effect, well known. And uh, the rectus spinae, so that's actually a muscle that wraps around, the, that attaches to the rib cage, so it could have an interesting uh, uh, respiratory effects, but they are also counteracting any kind of movement. Um, if you're moving your hand forward, they, they, that's the muscle you feel actually contracting, if you would look at that. So 
Um, these are all the movements that people are making. So we have uh, no movement. So let's see what happens when people are not moving, a flexion uh, condition. Um, let's see whether it actually starts. So flexion condition, these are the movements that we generally all, that we've already studied or actually only this muscle of this movement. And uh, we have an internal rotation and we have this external rotation. So if we just look at the, Oh, let's let it load, one second. It has some, uh, my computer is slow, one second. Yeah, okay, so just as, um, um, and people are also standing on a, on a, on a force plate. So we, we measure ground reaction force as well, which is, will give us some information about uh, whether there are, if your if you're center of mass changes. And if your center of mass changes, it means that you have to uh, adjust uh, and otherwise you would fall. So what we find for the internal rotation, this movement, right? Well, we indeed find that the pectoralis major is most active. If you go the other way around, of course, the infraspinatus is most active. This is not, this is not really, um, this is something that we should expect. But also we are, we are already, we can already show, for example, that in the extension movement, this movement, that the postural muscles are much more active than an external rotation. Uh, because in the external rotation, uh, the forces are more circular and, other, and for the extension, it's much more forwards. So uh, it's interesting that we already find that the anticipatory postural adjustments, indeed we find for certain movements and not for others, which means that if we find an uh, acoustic effect, it might be because it's especially the postural muscles are activated or not. And um, yeah, so we, we kind of, uh, we, we, we have, uh, we can conclude indeed that we are using these different movements and they will, uh, they will activate different muscles, which is not, yeah, it's not rocket science so far. Uh, no, never actually. But uh, um, so then we can start analyzing, right? So we have people vocalizing. Again, we have, we start with simple vocalizations. Um, they vocalize and then at a certain moment, they might be perturbed because they're moving. Um, and we can measure the peaks uh, relative to the stable vocalization. Um, we have some movement re recording, right? Uh, so we can say the movement starts here and ends there. So we have a movement and analysis window that we can use. For that same analysis window, we can say how much movement of the center of mass uh, happens. And we can say of all these different muscles, which ones was most active or less active, right? And what we already find is, uh, um, let's see if it pops up. Sorry. Uh, takes a while to load, one second. Okay, um, the other one doesn't want to load. So let's, let's give it one second. Well, maybe I'll start here and then jump back. So one thing that we find is that the postural muscles like the rectus abdominis, um, if um, I have a, a big change in the center of mass in any direction, then it, we also find that there is a higher um, higher activity of the postural muscles, which is the abs, right? And um, coincidentally, the rectus abdominis, I, I, for some reason, maybe I can go out here. Here you see it maybe. Um, this is actually the muscle activity of the rectus abdominis. And here we actually plot the, the higher the activity of the abs during these uh, upper limb movements, the higher the peak in the amplitude envelope of the voice acoustics. So we see a nice scaling that the, uh, the more you tense your abs during these movements, the, the higher that particular peak in the amplitude envelope. And we find it for other muscles as well, for the uh, pectoralis major, um, and for the, for the infraspinatus and the erectus spinae a little bit less. And we're also going to look at different aspects of the vocalization. Um, and I can show that, uh, let me see, slideshow. Oh, sorry, I, uh, I have to go on. But we, you can imagine, I'm gonna go through this, but uh, you can imagine that there are not only positive peaks, sometimes there are negative peaks, such that, um, one second, I'm gonna go through. So here, this is an internal rotation. And we find actually in some of these uh, examples that there's not only a positive peak, but also a negative peak. So that you can actually get a drop in, in uh, subglottal pressures. And it might be because the pectoralis major is sometimes associated also with, with uh, a dropping of the, or an inflation of the 
uh, uh, lungs. Um, so one thing that we're now investigating as well in the more uh, in more detailed research is looking whether particular muscles are also contributing um, to particular uh, negative or, or other changes in vocal acoustics, which would mean that not that not all gesture is born equal if it, uh, in in the way that it affects acoustics. Um, so to wrap up, and maybe um, we've now, with the, together with Susanna Fuchs, Frances Berlin, a, a, a respiratory researcher or a speech respiratory researcher, we have started to find new connections and there are many, it turns out. And that's the paper that uh, maybe some of you have read. So I'll leave it at that. that. But it turns out that babies around nine months do a lot of focal motor babbling. So they, they might become aware of uh, um, this biomechanics and starts to start to explore it. Um, bats already do focal motor uh, coupling uh, through these biomechanics. And there are even birds that do courtship displays, which is actually more, is, is not even for locomotion, but they also have coupling during their courtship displays between respiratory, the air sacs and, and their vocalization. And um, yeah, so there is much more to be done there. And we think it has some uh, implications for um, how we think about uh, gesture evolution. Um, but since I'm wrapping up, I think I'm gonna go to the end. Maybe one more example that I really like just to, uh, this is from Lara Pearson's work on uh, South Indian uh, Carnatic uh, music, where uh, we, when first looking at that, this, you were very much, I was very much almost uh, immediately already enthused by looking at this, that this might be some aspects of biomechanics come up here as well. So, Vin, do you think we can have oh, audio for this? Yeah, one? yeah, that's good. Yeah, I already, I already forgot. Um, audio. Yeah, okay, let's start over. Is it good? So uh, instead of seeing that biomechanics is something that they, the, the performer needs to deal with, it might also be part of the performance. And that's something that Larry Pearson and I uh, started to think about. And we've looked at the kinematics of uh, um, Larry Pearson has actually gone to India to have professional uh, Carnatic uh, vocal musicians um, with motion tracking and uh, vocal uh, analysis. We, we also show that their, the acceleration of their limbs are related to inflections in their vocal acoustics. Um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna end here. Um, I guess the take-home points for me is, uh, and maybe for you, uh, that there is some bodily meaning, and I, maybe I can explore that a little bit with you because I think um, I'm more on the experimental side. But uh, I always thought I was a bad <laughs> philosopher. That's why that's why I never went become a, a theoretical psychologist. But I do want to try to think about these things, how we can think of them as somehow inherently meaningful, not necessarily understood to be representational. And um, I think there's something in here as well. Um, um, I think uh, iconic function is not the basic, not most basic. Uh, and it's something that we argue in the paper with uh, Susanna. Um, biomechanics is something that constrains neural processes, right? There, there, there just is a dynamic relationship with that neural, neural processes. Uh, are, are, are attuned to uh, stabilities of the body and make use of them uh, uh, as well. I think we need to have a more formally worked out how gesture speech physics or biomechanics is incorporated in a particular language or with a particular prosodic regime, right? We know that these things change and are different. Um, and in general, I hope that this is kind of a, I hope this becomes a more well worked out example of higher order cognition that usually or previously was always thought of as uh, internally, neurally, um, 
uh, arbitrarily uh, invented. And I believe that, that this could be just one such an example. And I hope that in the end, we, we have something that is well worked out. Thanks. Sorry for going over time. It's like, can't help it. <laughs> Sorry, we couldn't find the button, uh, but uh, there were a lot, there was a lot of clapping here and uh, uh, and also from the audience, as you can see. So uh, thank you so much, and I'm so grateful to you that you didn't become theoretical philosopher, uh, because <laughs> I must say that uh, really, um, I mean, you have integrated a very very deep philosophical questions how. Uh, for example, how a whole body uh, actually does something, right? And not um, modules or, or, or just uh, um, uh, realizing particular function. Like we are a whole body and uh, at the same time, you managed to sort of, you know, show with a series of very elegant uh, demonstrations, experimental demonstrations, uh, how we can do research on, on that. Mm -hmm. Which is actually so fundamental in the interaction between people, right? So uh, now we have uh, time for questions, and uh, we can um, take questions from here. Maybe just uh, to avoid this uh, moment when uh, there is always a, a silence before the first question, <laughs> I will just ask a very silly question um, that I realized I don't I don't know when I was reading your paper. Uh, why 80 beats per minute? Is it a syllable rate? What is it? Well, well, the, the beat, why 80? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's close to the natural frequency of uh, movement. So uh, okay. at least for upper upper limb movement. So we checked a little bit what 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 do people generally move in if they if they just are, are allowed to move uh, in a rhythmic way and then it was close to their natural frequency. Actually, but we move or move while speaking because uh, yeah no there was only movement yeah we did we didn't check uh, we do have I still have data for example we asked a lot of people doing these experiments uh, or we tested what their natural frequencies were so I, I always wonder whether if we look at the data again and we look at the natural frequencies that depending on whether you're moving at your natural frequencies you might have different modulations or not but uh, yeah 80 BPM. Um, it's arbitrary, yes. And for some of the the uh, the yeah, for some of the work we do faster and slower uh, ones relative to that uh, eighty BPM. Yeah. Right, but this also made me think, you know, that even when we are doing our experiments, we need to observe the natural frequencies of our. Yeah. This is so cool. Which depends on bodies, different bodies. There's yeah, exactly. many different voices. <laughs> so yeah. we should uh, probably invite people to the lab and uh, making them move something and then calibrate them and then. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, now I, for the first time in this new work, we're really doing a lot of body measurements. So we're taking skin, uh, fat skin, skin fold uh, measurements, uh, circumference of the uh, upper and the lower arm just to, just to get them, I think we also should start to analyze different bodies having different capabilities and that, that might relate to these kind of uh, biomechanics, which we know, right? But I think uh, something that I was in the previous not so much sensitive about, and I hope to become more sensitive to that diversity. Yeah, yeah but it's uh, also becomes, uh, I think the explanations become a little bit easier when you weave behavior out of something that is already there, then, if you have to, you know, reinvent it from scratch, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Questions? Yeah, Julian. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you for, for the wonderful talk. Uh, do you hear me well? Okay. Yeah, 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 I can hear you, yeah. Okay, so, um, okay, I am amazed by, by multiple things, but what got me thinking is the mm, term Iconicity, what does iconic gesture is? I believe in gesture studies, it is one thing, but uh, in Persian uh, terms, in Persian semiotics, um, icons often, um, the meaning of an icon is often the quality of something, like uh, quality of being energized 
or quality of being passive. It is already something which, which is meaningful and can be communicated. And in this sense, uh, even those uh, biomechanical relations that you talked about are something which uh, it is a level of meaning already, it's a level of, of, of iconic meaning. And I was, uh, I'm just curious, how much do you think this can be um, visible or somehow interpreted by other people? Do they notice such things? Do they notice when their interlocutor is, uh, for instance, um, unstable due to the gestures they make? Make? Do you think it is a communicative uh, layer already? Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly what I want to move towards. I, I do have the feeling so, um, like in Persian uh, kind of uh, framework. I was going more for the indexical uh, um, the indexical uh, symbol in the sense that something can be causally connected to the thing that it communicates indirectly. Um, and I feel like anger is, it's like a Jamesian idea, right? What, what, what is anger? Uh, is there any anger left if we, don't show, if we don't show the gesture, right? Or if the gesture is not there, that's part of my anger. It's part of my experience of anger. Uh, um, so yes, I've, 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 and that's also why I think I'm a bad philosopher because I, I can't get out of this kind of loopy thinking. Is this iconics? Well, <laughs> does the iconic representation is often is also understood as a representation? Whilst I think bodily bodily iconics in 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 is not understood as a representation. It is the thing. So for me, iconics are. Yeah, it depends on your framework, right? And if I read Deacon, uh, Terence Deacon's, uh, uh, then Iconics is for me completely different uh, in his in his uh, framework. Uh, so he said Iconics becomes the most basic kind of uh, uh, symbol there is. Um, but yeah, I I, I find myself uh, being trapped by all these concepts. And but actually, what you're saying, I'm also trying to say this is already meaningful. I have the feeling that we get something for free. Uh, in this kind of, uh, we get for free that uh, uh, language was not is not is not just uh, randomly emerging. It could have been different. It could not have been different. It could not have been different in the sense that our bodies are set up in a certain ways, which will lead to certain uh, uh, degrees of freedom and uh, distributions of preferred mo movements, and that already gives us a space to work with, right? Um, and that's why, and I think you also see it a little bit in like uh, Petzula's uh, kind of way of thinking and that we try to, we actually try to use the, the boundaries of our capacities to be the, at moments that we want to communicate. It's maybe, it's, it's maybe, there's maybe a reason why it's really tiring to be angry all the time <laughs> because uh, uh, you 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 are operating at the boundaries of your uh, of your muscle tensioning, your muscle tonus. Yeah, so I'm sorry. So I can can go forever, but I I think you can see that directly. And then I I'm willing to avoid the word iconic then because it's more direct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So what is what is the word for something meaningful that is more direct than iconic? Well, it's an emotion. An emotion is also not iconic of my uh, of an emotion. Uh, an emotional expression is not iconic of my emotion, right? Oh, I think a, it's, it's a part of it. It's, it's a, not. A, yeah, it's, it's a part of it. Constitutes it. It's a sign. It's a thing itself. Yeah. Yeah. So I believe that's much more closer to that. And in a what is what is an emotional expression in Empiricean framework? An index, or is it something else? I don't know, actually. I don't know, but uh, I'm very f f uh, also familiar with the feeling of walking in circles. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, <laughs> welcome to the to, to the crowd, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but I think in general, people who, who, who really take emergence, for example, seriously, uh, they do walk in circle and there is nothing wrong with them. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, that's yeah. a nice thing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, yeah. any other questions? Uh, yeah. uh, can you well? Uh, not really, but it's also my laptop. It's really, I can't yeah. get any louder. So, uh, yeah, it's better. I would. 
I wonder why, uh, I wonder because we got two reals, two different modalities, gesture jazz, jazz, and speech. And I was really amazed by the uh, video we showed on predicting uh, gestures from speech. And I'm uh, on a technical level, I'm really interested what are the basic features of uh, speech and the gestures which were in this study and could, for example, be also, uh, you know, reversed. And could we uh, use gesture to predict the prototype? Yeah, uh, especially given the, the work in the speech synthesis that is going all around now that about the expressive speech synthesis and maybe this would look. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think um, uh, I think there is mutual information in both streams, right? So uh, I think uh, yes, I think there are there are. Uh, I think yes, I think it's uh, possible. And I don't. I, it's often the other way around. So from speech to gesture, um, but there is also some work from um, e Eiffel Verstel from KTH in Sweden. Where they also look at these correlations between different kinematics and different uh, features of speech um, that I, I'm happy to share as well. But I also was fascinated by that, that, that particular work where they look particularly at the kind of informational variables that might co vary. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting. I feel like uh, that's a whole new field that is now emerging that also, yeah, it's also showing how rich the information is. Um, that that our methods in cognitive science were actually not really able to grasp, and of course there there is also a lot of critique in the deep learning models. But for in a, I, there is also a beauty to deep learning models that they can show what kind of information there is that can be used, even though we don't know what that information is yet. Is yet, uh, uh, but for these kinds of things, there seems to be that there is much more information in acoustics about gesture, and I would not be, be surprised if it's also more the other way around, right? Yeah, and especially. The, the, that would be a, exactly the thesis that I'm trying to like prepare here, right? So yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Thanks. I think that the another question here is uh, there is so much information in uh, there, as you are saying, in the acoustics about gesture and uh, in gesture about acoustic. But the other question is, do we use it as people, as interactants, and we? And which information we use uh, for what? And I was, I was pondering on your on your statement on the one uh, of the slides that, you know, uh, somebody showed that we can speak without gesture. Mm. Okay, we can probably people who have to speak a lot on the radio or something like this. Maybe they or or at consecutive translators in the conferences. I, uh, or simultaneous rather, maybe they save on, on this um, energetic uh, cost. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, does it have the same interactive effect if we speak the same? No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. So uh, I hope that, that was my next question. Are you moving also towards interaction, especially I'm interested in, you know, infants and scaffolding of gestural development as uh, as uh, let's say, I don't know, I don't want to say towards more adult <laughs> gesturing, but uh, more conventional maybe gesturing. Is gesturing becoming more conventional, even if it is so entrained with our uh, biophysics? Um, so that's one, one question, and how does, can it arise in interaction? And the other is, you know, uh, are you yeah are you moving towards the interaction? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty individualistic, which is a kind of uncommon for well, if it's an applied to <laughs> radical embodied cognition, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm uh yes. But I, I guess I, I will guard myself always. Well, I feel we have to start with the with the body first for these kind of processes and then move out. Because I think if I started the other way around, I would still be lost now. Um and now I feel like I have something that we can build on. Uh, uh, so I feel like the next question for me would be depending on the language you speak, on the, the kind of prosodic targets you have to uh, hit. Sometimes they're uh, uh, rise in the F0, sometimes they're decreasing the F0. Is it the case, for example, that once we know from our research that certain muscles actually lead to a decrease rather than an increase, 
that people even have to do, even if they have to organize themselves into a representational gesture, are they more likely to modulate those muscles that are in line with their prosodic targets? For mm -hmm. me, that would be uh, another level of complexity where you show that gestures are not um, uh, organized from, from a, a gesture library somewhere in the brain or a gesture lexicon, as gesture stud studies would say. No, they're organized flexibly, <coughs> the synergies that you need on the fly. And I, I hope that will be my dream that you end there, that we could show, well, gestures, trajectories, and uh, motor control uh, parameters are actually designed depending on the kind of prosodic targets you want to hit as well. And it doesn't matter if you're also representing or organizing yourself as to represent. Um, um, and I think those kinds of things can be uh, researched in, in interaction and should be researched in interaction. Um, yeah, no, the only thing that we did is like the synchronization experiment, right? We, can people listen to the sound and is it informative about the movement? Yeah, to a certain extent, yes. Uh, for me, it's also maybe a way into the our classic uh, things that we always cite, like um, the, 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 the balance experiment where people are standing in, uh, next to each other but can't see each other, but their postural sway uh, starts to relate, right? I feel like that might also be... Um, related to uh, motor information being present in the uh, acoustic uh, or acoustic information about body movements. Um, because that to me was always a little bit of a magical effect. Uh, but now I think, well, maybe there's also more information on acoustics. I do think, I do, I think there is also, this is just a really small thing. It just, it, I, I, think, I don't think by a gesture of vocal biomechanics is, we can hype it up, I can hype it up to like until tomorrow, but it's also just a small nudge. And I think where language is uh, uh, an interaction is all consists of all these small nudges that make our systems less arbitrary, get some meaning from free for free with these nudges. But I can't say that gesture focal bi biomechanics is key to, under uh, key to uh, mutual understanding or anything like that. Or, I don't know, maybe I'm uh, too skeptical, but... No, I think uh, if I may say, I think you are too skeptical because what you are showing is actually uh, how much entangled uh, uh, those various types of actions are. And uh, what is fascinating, I think, in development is uh, basically how they get individuated as a, for example, vocal layer, where you show very nicely how it, uh, in bipedals, for example, it, it can get decoupled easier mm -hmm. uh, from certain type of movements. And uh, perhaps uh, the same happens with movements that they can sort of form a system, which is uh, as Iverson, I love this, uh, this uh, saying by yeah. uh, this phrase by Iverson, but it's like two fins of a fish, right? It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Speech. It's, it's very much so that with one fish, you just, uh, you know, with one fin, you, you just uh, swim in circles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but uh, if you don't perceive it as a whole, then you don't understand what is needed, what scaffolding is needed to actually disentangle, to, to make the vocal layer, let's say, individuate mm -hmm. from this mess, right? So it's it's also a different question that you are asking and uh, maybe also different than, I was uh, a bit surprised in your in your paper only by one thing that you, yeah, yeah. That you put so much attention on uh, what, what came first, you know, speech or gesture. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. For me, it was always a weird question. <laughs> so yeah. That, uh, well, I, who cares? I mean, uh, it's more interesting how it individuates actually as a system, if we see it as a system, right? So yeah, no, you know, it's definitely, I think that the whole that theoretical discussion has kind of, but I also feel like asking it in that way has led to the particular answers that we have given so far. And these answers were always, well, gestures uh, proliferated because they were representationally super potent and they added something. And since we ask that question in that way, we tend to think that gesture's only function is representational. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in, all, in all these all these evolutionary accounts so far, beat gestures were something that, uh, or this beat-like quality of gesture was always put as the latest thing that developed 
even after we had a language, which yeah. I think how how it's so so basic. But mm -hmm. I think because we asked how why why did gesture occur at all, and then we started to think about language and we need something powerful. Well, then then the representational capacity of gesture that could kickstart that kind of story that that that's that's where you go. But um, yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, yeah, you're right. I think the the question is not as interesting, not as interesting. Um, oh, I mean, it's good that you because you you've shown also very nicely that uh, it sort of uh, gives another slant on on this on those questions. Maybe the slant is uh, to make it less important, which is yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, but that's what we tried. We just said, well, you have these different stories. I think. In every in every of these stories, gesture speech biomechanics fits in because uh, you, you you started to speak. Uh, you, you they, it's like we said. Well, it's not whether gesture or speech started first, but when did they entangle? Uh, and at any of these stories, they started to entangle at some point. So how, how they yeah. are entangled and how they disentangle? What do they need from the environment? Also, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 to work, yeah. To work yeah. together. Uh, that's that's the questions. Uh, I, I wanted to ask if anybody um, has a question because um, I feel we are here in a large group, so we are dominating the discussion. But uh, you're very much uh, please raise your hand or just switch on your mic as as you would prefer. Is somebody? Okay. If I may. <laughs> yes. Hello. Thank you for your uh, extremely interesting lecture. It was really uh, uh, a very inspiring one. I, I mean, that <laughs> sort of uh, coming from very, very basic uh, physiological phenomena to uh, complex cognitive functions and how they <laughs> are involved. Uh, this is really uh, uh, impressive work. And well, maybe it's not a question. <laughs> maybe it's um, a sort of question. Um, I'm just thinking about uh, some kind of um, diagnostic value of, of your work. I mean, for, uh, rather potential, potential diagnostic application to not only in the, in the medical sense, in the sense of uh, like uh, psychiatry or psych psychology, but also uh, to diagnose certain uh, communicative issues, uh, if they can be detected uh, by tracking some of these uh, correlations between uh, speech and uh, some certain parameters uh, of movement, if you can see any applications like that. And of course, uh, what I, <laughs> one thing that came to my mind in the meantime was uh, a paper by David Gibbon, uh, a phonetician, uh, who actually uh, sort of inspired me to, to um, start my research in gesture because he pointed to a very uh, obvious fact that speech is also gestures. It's <laughs> just a stream of gestures, which is different because it causes some uh, you know, acoustic uh, uh, side effects, <laughs> but in yeah. principle, it's, it's just a gesture. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's a yeah. I think in the yeah. If I talk to phonet phoneticians, or they're generally confused if you start with gesture just without saying I'm talking about hand gestures, right? So uh, and Marley Punti in this chapter, he didn't make a distinction, and it's still not clear: is it a speech gesture or is it a right, kind of? I think you're you're right there. Yeah, diagnostics. I I feel like. Um, the if we would have a way to quantify the degree to which you choose a certain bio biomechanical alignment or not. For example, the, the there's one example of the brown-headed cowbird that does this courtship displays and and it, uh, um, and it is found that if they're doing the courtship displays that the wing beats, um, the muscles that they use are also used for respiratory, uh, to control respiration. But at a certain moment, they decouple. Um, they stop singing altogether because they're too vigorously moving. So in that they make a choice between alignment and counteraction, and I feel like that kind of abstract idea that the the the, the 
the choice for alignment or uh, the choice for counteraction, that might be something that shifts. It might be something's really, really, really angry. I'm not even saying anything anymore. I'm just, <laughs> I, I don't know why I keep saying angry. It could also be happy, right? Uh, but if I, if I keep, uh, maybe I, I choose a certain, um, I, I align myself differently. And I feel like maybe that's something fundamental to our phenomenal experience or our being in the world, uh, aligning our, our systems in a certain way, not aligning them, choosing to counteract them, which might be tiring sometimes, right? It's also the case in, a, in a flying bats, they echolocate and they synchronize with their wing beats, but they don't have to. If they, if they need to evade for an object, they, uh, they actually decouple. Um, so I feel like the di I, that's more an abstract answer and something that I think about is that our phenomenology might be not so much dependent on what we do, but how we integrate the things that we do and that there are levels of alignment and counteraction and maybe something more continuous that might be informative about our uh, maybe emotional states or depression or any anything else, I would say. I don't know even how to start there, but uh, I guess uh, you could of course start with um, uh, the relation between acceleration and acoustics, whether it's more or less stable for some participants than others or patients, but. Yeah, it's a huge question. I know it's a huge question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a yeah. couple of words, of course, uh, about, for instance, dedicated to, 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 to our ability as naive observers, how we perceive these, I say, asynchronies uh, mm -hmm. in human yeah. behavior. But it may also have some diagnostic value, I think. But thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Any any other questions? Uh, if not, I think uh, we do. You have uh, still a couple of minutes, or yeah, need to to run. Okay, because um, yeah, we just. Uh, a comment also on, uh, on on your on your paper. Uh, we were recording some uh, mother infant interactions, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, of course, so when reading your your paper, the, the first thing that came to to my mind were, were the tennis matches when people you know yell or yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, uh, really synchronize uh, the, the voicing, or it, it it is evident that it's helping them. In various ways, but but I also thought about this uh, very weird case that we had in the lab, where we were um, coding um, mother-infant inter interaction, and there were those weird sounds that we were quarreling over how to code them, and they were breathing. So some of the breathing is audible and is taken by the mother. <laughs> as contributions to the interaction by the infant. So they become, in a sense, through the mothers, you know, doing her dance of accepting this as a, as a contribution, they, they become um, sort of speech sounds or sounds, right, vocalizations. And uh, really there were two fr fractions in the, in the lab that uh, some people wanted to code it as, uh, as breathing and others mm -hmm. As, yeah. as 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 uh, vocalization, and we could not agree, and we didn't agree. I mean, we mm -hmm. we 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 coded them as breathing, <laughs> and uh, and we had to look uh, how how they enter can enter the analysis, and if and so so this is another um, maybe example of um, of a behavior that has a potential, right, mm -hmm. to to be a coordinative behavior between people. But it depends, you know, how how it is reacted to and how how it is uptaken by the by the uh, interaction. So, so one one thing. And the second, but second thing I wanted to to also ask you is that you um, all, it's on the level of an individual. Um, you at some point you mentioned also syntactic um, considerations, and I was wondering if we uh, can. You know, there are various uh, works that show that, for example, when you, uh, you perceive uh, beeps uh, as being close to syntactic boundary because you, you make a hole out of it. And I, I, was, I was thinking if you, if you were considering also, you know, 
um, going into this direction or, or linking this to movement also, how, how the prosody uh, aligns both with movement and with syntax of the of the yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, um, on your first point, yes, I, I totally agree. I feel like uh, somehow, think I, I really like how you frame it. I'm also thinking about La uh, Laura McCoon's work on grunts, where babies start to try to to reach and then they, they grunt, and then the parent sees it and then sees it as mm -hmm. an invitation to get something, and then the grunt becomes something that is employed as a communication. And I feel like everything is potentially representation, right? Any similarity or any kind of um, association is potentially uh, communicative or representational. I'm quite, I'm willing to say that gestures are representational, even though they're, they don't have mental representation. So I'm, I'm okay with the term representation, but everything is in potential representation, but you need users that need to query and pick up on invariance in those potential representations to, to, uh, to, to promote something. Uh, to become communicative and meaningful, right? Mm -hmm. So I feel like that Persian kind of, uh, it's not only the, the representee of, or the representation, but also the user of the representation. Um, and I feel like that's happening in development. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and also with gesture speech uh, coupling at a certain moment, there is now a lot of research. Um, and also people, maybe you, you might know Suzanne Ladonsky has a really great uh, paper where they did some motion tracking, for example, on, on uh, uh, infants and uh, actually something that, that I, I was thinking doing uh, myself at some point, um, but that's not necessary anymore because that work is being done right now. Um, but that that I feel like um, it starts out as something that has a potential and is, is nothing really there yet, but it becomes solicited from the social environment. So, uh, without interaction, this whole thing would collapse and would be. Would be on the outside, uh, so uh, on the outskirts. So even though it doesn't really come back in my research a lot, I do think without interaction, this gesture focal bi biomechanics would not be there, right? Uh, I think it's solicited, uh, and uh, yeah. So um, yeah, and maybe just just to complete the, the thought. So there are some stabilities of the body uh, that may be picked out by the social environment, or they may be solicited by the social environment to become meaningful and. Uh, that's yeah. That's how I, I guess uh, I would describe it. Um, yes, yeah, syntax. Yeah, I, I just know I know too little about it. So some people think that I'm a linguist, but I, I actually am not. <laughs> uh, so I'm not where uh, uh, syntax is, is difficult. So we're we're looking at, for example, lexical stress. So depending on the language, you say um, what do you say? Um, um, well, it depends. You have the same words, but the stress is slightly different. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, pyramide in Dutch or pyramide, uh, I think in, uh, in Spanish, pyramide. Well, I can't do it. But uh, anyway, you have different stress depending on the syntactical uh, or at least on the or either on the syntactical level of the sentence where you say that you often have a pitch accent in a different place or you have a lexical stress on the same word, but uh, with the same meaning, but at a different place. And we're looking at whether gestures kind of um, interact where where you, um, where your prosodic regime of your language should say that it, where, where it is. And we have, we have some really cool results. Uh, one thing that we think we are seeing is that if I, if I am a second language learner, and I know that pyramide, the lexical stress should that go at the end, but I'm produ producing it in my, uh, uh, in my, let's say, my second language. Um, then my gesture is slightly more attracted to that L1. It seems to bifurcate a little bit. It seems to be a gesture accent. Um, so it seems that uh, we also have an accent in our gesturing if it comes to timing our gestures with the lexical stress. Uh, um, but we're still we're still finding out whether this is really the case and looking at sanity checks. But uh, it seems to be the case. So that's how far we went. But uh, yeah, other than that, it's beyond. It's really beyond me. Um, but we know that prosodic regimes are very much dependent on the syntactical organizations. And uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it will be really. But but this, that's another great factor that we can actually merge in our explanations and that we have sort of multi stabilities of gesturing or coupling mm -hmm. gestures with uh, with speech and then uh, you know um, discovering those and uh, 
having them also is potential you know, explanations for the mm. current behavior. This is really, really great. Thanks, thanks. Any, any other questions or, or comments? Or do you, I'm looking at the, at the virtual uh, participants as, as well. Thank you so much, then. I mean, yeah, thank you. Really great. It was uh, really great to, to see you. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I can, uh, yeah. I, we, they, these are open, right? So I'm 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 looking forward to whoever you're going to invite after because, uh, yeah, yeah. Super. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah.